do Celtic nations even exist and what are they if so? This is Ben Schwellen. I talk about British languages, cultures, and histories and stuff. Today, I'm gonna ask that question and answer it for you. If you clicked on this video, I'm sure you are aware at least of things called Celtic festivals or Celtic Druidism, kind of cliche terms that people use to define, kind of just a magic box that you pull lots of stuff out of. But what about the nations themselves? And by the Celtic nations, people tend to think of Scotland, Cymru, that's Wales, Ireland, Brittany, which is over the water, not in the British Isles, the Isle of Man, and Cornwall. And these six are quite different in many ways from each other. And it's important that we're aware of what their distinct cultures are when we're talking about the term Celtic. Now, where did this word come from? What is its history? Well, back to Greece. In 517 BCE, that's a long time ago, Hecaetus Miletius spoke about a people living around present-day Marseille in the south of France, and he called them Keltoi. What this word means is unclear. Obviously, it was a long time ago. But in the next century, in the 5th century, Herodotus, another Greek, wrote about people called Keltoi again, living near the source of the river Danube in present-day South Germany. A bit later, a Roman statesman called Pliny the Elder wrote about a people in present-day Portugal calling themselves Celtici. And Julius Caesar, who conquered present-day France, said that the Gauls called themselves Celts. But should we trust the man who wrote an entire book called The Gallic Wars, giving derogatory stereotypes of these people and boasting of his oppressing them. I don't really want to trust the guy who wiped these people out to judge what they called themselves. Tacitus, another Roman a historian, he said that those in Britain were different, but that they followed similar customs and were very similar to the Gauls. But he said they resembled them, not that they were the same people, and he calls them Britons. And the earliest name for these peoples in Britain comes again from a Greek. Theus, centuries before these Romans, in around the year 320 or 330 BCE, he goes on a voyage by sea around the British Isles and he calls these people Bretanoi or Bretanoi, which is very different from what the Greeks called the peoples immediately to the north of them, Celts. We get glimpses during the Roman conquest that there's two distinct, very distinct groups here, the British and the Irish. That's another st and these were different ethnicities according to the Romans and how they saw nations and peoples, which is not like we see it today, by the way. There was not this concept of a racial ethnicity. So what about going forward? Well, we have a period of a thousand years, more than a thousand years, 1500 years, where there's no, there's no mention of Celts, really. There's different groups of people, not until the year 1707 and Edward Lloyd, the famous Welsh botanist and linguist who gave the term Celtic languages, does this term really re-emerge? And it's specifically linguistic, it's not in terms of any kind of ethnic or nationalistic fervour. We do see a Celtic essence being used in English from this point forward. Edward Lloyd. And let me know if you want a video about him. And he classifies these languages as Celtic languages. We're still not talking about a Celtic people here, or Celtic peoples. These are languages 
it's the English who begin to call these people Celtic as they, through the 19th century, begin to call themselves British. And so as they take the mantle of British off the Cornish and Welsh and place it upon themselves, they then call these people another name, Celt, to stop calling those people British, because you can't have two forms of Britishness, can you? And so Celt, others, and it's used in a derogatory term towards the Irish during the Gaelic Revival as Irish nationalism gathers pace, which takes us into today. What called Celtic when it was an English imposition upon those things? And in the terms of the Breton, which or under the French state, this was a similar othering. It was not a native, that is what we call ourselves. They, you can see it clearly in Breton mythology and ethos and history, they called themselves British. They came from Britain. That, it's in their name. Breton, Bres, Bresonneg, the name of their language. It means British. So if these peoples are Celtic, first we have two questions then. What is Celtic? Or what is the trait, rather, that makes them all similar in any sense? How are they similar, all six of these nations, in any way? So we're going to go through and I'm going to compare these six countries in different ways to try and see what is Celtic? What's the common thread of these peoples? There are many ways you can classify a group of people. You have the Muslim world. You have the Nordic nations. The Slavic peoples. The Sino-Tibetan peoples. So let's start with that Nordic one. That's a geographic sphere rather than a linguistic or religious because Finland doesn't belong to these other nations in that Germanic sense. So this is a, a geographic sphere, like Scandinavian, but a bit wider. Could we say that about the Celtic nations? Well, no, because then you would have to include England. Are you going to call England a Celtic nation? And then you have to think, well, Brittany is not on these islands. So the term Celtic is not a geographic Term. What else could we think about here? Let's go to the languages themselves. It is accepted that these are Celtic languages, but does that define these nations? Is it a requisite of these nations? In the case of Wales, where I am, and the language that I prefer is Welsh, and Welsh is a core, basic part of what it is to be Welsh. You can't have Wales without the Welsh language. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it has what has ensured the survival of this culture in the long run of things. There are other bits of Welshness, but here more people speak a Celtic language as a normal everyday function than the rest of the Celtic nations. So it is true here, but if you go to Scotland, the Kingdom of Alba emerged, or the Kingdom of Scotland emerged in the 7th to 9th centuries. And this was not a Celtic speaking people at that time. This was an Anglic kingdom. It adopted Gaelic and then left it. But the core and the laws and the, the institutions of this kingdom were not Celtic speaking. In fact, Scotland colonized the North Welsh out and then slowly belittled and attacked the Gaels and pushed them to the margins of Scottish society. It wasn't the English in Scotland that were pushing the Celts out. It was the Scots, which means Scotland is very different to the other Celtic nations in that regard. The native language of Ireland was Irish. It formed in that identity. I think that's quite clear. That's indisputable. 
Cornwall? That, that, that's complicated because you had a language that went out as a community language entirely. I mean, I'm not saying that Cornish language is not a part of Cornwall and that it always will be, of course. But that break of severing the communal link over the centuries, that's significant. That changes your identity. There is no way for it not to. And then the Isle of Man. It came under Norwegian influence and then the, the Manx language was pushed out. We have recordings of it before it died, which is very different to the case of Cornish. That's interesting. So you have people speaking Manx, a very few, but the language is English on the Isle of Man. And then you have Brittany, which is different again because you have three languages here. You wouldn't expect that. You have the Breton language in the West. You have Gallo, which is a Romance language that's deeply influenced by Breton. And you have French. The bourgeois language in Brittany was French. The ecclesiastical centers and their history in terms of that is very different. Look at this graph here in terms of the linguistic influences of these six nations. Now I say British, by that I mean the Brythonic that created Welsh, Cornish and Breton. And I say Irish, the language which created modern Irish, Manx and Scots Gaelic. And I say English, which is sense is Anglic, it created English and Scots and French. And all of these are at very different points of influences between these four. There's nothing truly common between all of these nations. The British ones, Cornish, Welsh, Breton, French kind of pushes Breton away a bit. I'm putting these nations here, not languages, to show you that the language makeup of the entire nation and the linguistic identity between these six nations are very different. There's nothing, almost nothing in common between them except that a few people at least in every one of these six nations speaks some form of a Celtic language. But here's the thing, as a Welsh speaker, if you speak Irish or Scots Gaelic just plainly to me, I'm not going to understand what you mean. If you speak Cornish or Breton, I can sort of understand you and vice versa with a Scots Gaelic speaker to an Irish speaker, they can understand each other, sort of. That's important. Going back to that Goidelic and Brythonic, we have two distinct peoples here. You could say it's because those languages come from those places originally in Wales, Ireland, etc. But Scots Gaelic and Breton, or because of immigrations to those countries. So it's not so simple, is it? Religion in these six nations is very complicated. Wales was the first clearly Christian nation of these Isles. Okay, you could say probably Cornwall as well, but the Irish and up north in Scotland were clearly later than Wales was. The earliest Christian martyrs in Wales were in the third century. That's very early. Even our native tales in Wales, the elements of paganism are so faint, distorted and forgotten that they have been lost. Whereas in Ireland, it's very different. There's a different mythological tradition, though Cír and Lir are linked in terms of an ancient Celtic sea god. But this is probably simply coincidence of being linguistic cognates. The Breton, on the other hand, they did not suffer the Reformation the Protestant Reformation, like these islands did.
The Protestant Reformation was the breaking of the backbone of the Cornish language. It has never recovered from the apocalyptic century that Cornwall suffered. Going forward, Wales was obedient and ran to Protestantism, begging to be loyal to that faith. And that is why its language has survived to such an extent. A very practical mentality. Ireland, on the other hand, I'm sure you were acquainted with the history of the story. Catholic, Protestant. The Irish flag represents peace between those two groups, an essential request for the stability of a new nation. And that revolution that produced it, the Irish Republic, it really did create a new nation, strikingly and markedly different from the past. Wales and Scotland, they've never gone through that. Brittany has, but it remained Catholic without that Protestant imposition, though the French Republic has no religion, of course. They don't do God, which is another way to delude any Celtic identity. But Scotland in terms of religion is most interesting. You had Catholicism pushed out. You had people holding on, faint vestiges, but then immigration brought Catholicism back in. And so religion of these six nations is no simple matter and there's nothing linking them together as a group. So there's no Celtic Church. There was once, a very long time ago. But since we resolved the matter of when Easter is, that went out. One of the reasons why I made this video was because I often meet Welsh nationalists who claim that Welsh or the Celtic peoples are somehow more collective or left-wing or socialist than any other peoples. And I, I must laugh at this because it shows that one knows almost nothing of our history or the relations that we have with the other Celtic nations, nor what their histories are. So let's look at the political, the dominant political party in each of these six nations. Beginning in my own, in Wales, we are centre-left. this point in our history. The Labour Party, Welsh Labour dominates often with Plaid Cymru, which is a bit further left. But we are centre-left dominant in this country. In Scotland, it is centre-left again, but it's not quite as far. It's still centre-left, we'll grant that. Social democracy. And in Britannia, over the water, it is a social democratic party again. It's not a nationalist party like in Scotland, but it's more like Wales, frankly. It's the French Labour Party, essentially, but with a, a Breton flair. So that's common between those three, but the other three are very different politically, and there's a reason why, and I'll show you. Cornwall? It has traditionally gone back and forth between conservative or centre-right and liberal centre. So Cornwall has been staunchly over centuries now, centre to centre right. At present, the Conservatives are dominant on their council, but the Liberals are right up there and are threatening its neck and neck, as has been most of Cornish political history in the modern age. The Isle of Man, it's quite a complex situation with the banking industry, so most of them are independent, which, let's be honest, if you're familiar with UK or the politics on these islands, independent is a code word for conservative. Usually, not all the time, I'll ground, but usually 
It just means we're conservative, but we don't really want people to know that we're conservative. But yet the largest party on the Isle of Man, per se, in terms of membership and such, is Parti Liberalach Vanin, Isle of Man Liberal Party. So again, they're much more like Cornwall. Centre, centre, right, if what we say about the independent is true. Going to Ireland, Fine Gael has ruled quite a while, which is centre, or centre, soft centre, right. The Fine Foil, centre, right. So we have two strains of political thought here. Social democratic left and liberal centre right. Not hard conservative, that's that's interesting. You should note that. You have liberal and social democratic as the two dominant strains in Celtic politics. And there's a reason for this, I think. I think what we have here is these peoples who feel like there's some kind of oppressive weight or not independent, then they vote left. But in the other three, in Ireland and Man, they have their own banking institutions and they'd rather keep it stable so they don't vote for left-wing parties. And in Cornwall, they don't seem too fast. So they don't want to join the oppressor versus oppressed divide. There's nothing suggesting there's a commonality between all six of these nations. The political sense here crosses, overlaps British speaking and Irish speaking, as did the religion. Just the briefest note on laws. This is not about the ancient laws, of which Ireland especially had a firm oral and later written tradition in ancient legal code, as did Wales as well in the laws of Huwava. But the other nations didn't quite have as much of a legal tradition. In the modern sense of what these nations are today, we have three different legal traditions. There are four legal systems in the Celtic nations, actually. Wales is not fully branched off yet. It's slowly forming a canon of its own laws under our Senate. Cornwall has no separate legal jurisdiction or much of a history. It did have the Stannery Parliament, which was to do with tin mining rights, which was an extension of English law. The Irish Republic is based upon English common law with some faint, faint elements, mostly just titles, from its earlier Brehm law tradition. So that's one tradition. The Scots, they did not form their legal code from any type of Celtic source. They formed an Anglic kingdom. And though they brought in Gallic and those traditions, they later pushed them out, and their legal tradition was pushing down. It was a, ordained by the king, which is very different. Brittany was another matter entirely. It had a series of duchies, which were quasi-independent of the kingdom of France, less and less so until the French Revolution ruined that exercise and brought them into Napoleonic code and Roman law. Ah, I almost forgot about Manx law. They honestly have the claim of any Celtic nation to be the strongest continuation of Celtic law, though their legal system is now a fusion of Brehon and Norse Udo, if I said that right, basically Viking law but it's been heavily influenced and shaped by English common law. So this is kind of a tripart fusion, and they are quasi mostly independent of the United Kingdom for tax purposes, of course. Yeah. 
my concluding thoughts are that we don't have Celtic nations. We have British nations and Irish or Gaelic nations. I think calling us all Celtic removes a piece of our identity that is essential if we want them to endure. And so I think Wales, Cornwall and Brittany are Brythonic or British nations and that Ireland and Man are Gaelic or Irish nations and Scotland they're beautifully unique in that this is certainly a Germanic people, an Anglic Scot people, but they've got little flavorings of the Gaels and the faintest remnant of the Welsh inheritance which founded the cities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, I should add. But it was a long time ago. What do you think? Do you think that Celtic nations exist? Do you think that we should call them such? Do you think that it should be anything beyond the terms for the languages? Is there a Celtic people? Let me down in the comments. Hey, as always, Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.